Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully, everyone was able to enjoy their lunch and are now ready to dive in on the remaining 10 topics on the agenda for this afternoon. Uh, I am now going to turn the podium over to uh, Shannon McConnell Lamptey, who will uh, coordinate the first two presentations after lunch. Shannon? Thanks, thanks. Good afternoon. The first topic for this afternoon's um, segment is Torloff Cyst, and this is on page 56 in part two of the agenda handout. Now, this topic was originally presented at the September 2017 Coordination and Maintenance meeting. At that time, the requester um, was proposing a new code at category G54 for nerve root and plexus disorders. However, based on public comments that we received following that meeting, input from various clinical subject matter experts, as well as consulting with the World Health Organization, a revised proposal uh, is being presented for your consideration. WHO has provided guidance that this condition would be appropriately classified in ICD-10 and therefore in ICD-10-CM at subcategory 96.1, disorders of meninges not elsewhere classified. The following proposal, proposed new code is to identify this condition in ICD-10-CM, which would align with that and be consistent with what is currently in ICD-11. So at category G96, creating a new subcategory, G96.19, other disorders of meninges not elsewhere classified, there will be a new code, G96.191, for peri perineural cyst with the following inclusion terms, Tarloff cyst, sacral nerve root cyst, lumbar nerve root cyst, thoracic nerve root cyst, and cervical nerve root cyst. An additional new code would be G96.198 for other disorders of meninges not elsewhere classified. So at this time, I want to open the floor for any questions or comments here in the room. Okay, seeing none. Moderator, um, could you please open the lines for any questions or concerns? Okay, hearing none, uh, we will go ahead and we will move on to the next topic. The next topic is in part one of the agenda handout on page 58. The topic is refractory gastroesophageal reflux disease. And today we have Dr. Michael Shetline to present the clinical background. Dr. Shetline is the Chief Medical Officer with Ironwood Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Shetline. Thank you, and thanks to the committee for the opportunity to speak. Uh, again, I'm Mike Shetline. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Ironwood, and I am a gastroenterologist. And I would just like to add that we're speaking today for the actual diagnostic code for refractory GERD. Uh, Ironwood currently does not have any products commercially available in this space. However, being a GI healthcare company, we do look at the medical needs of patients with GI disorders and patients who have persistent symptoms in a setting of standard therapy for reflux disease are a very, uh, it's a very big medical need from our perspective. And that's the focus of this presentation, refractory GERD. So GERD, as you heard, is really a motility disorder that allows contents of the stomach to actually move into the esophagus and is responsible for a lot of morbidity and a lot of problems in patients who have this disease. It's a very common medical condition and it includes significant complications like esophagitis, strictures, and Barrett's. And Barrett's esophagus is a pre-malignant condition. And however, it's interesting though, because based on the prevalence of GERD and the known complexity in the pathophysiology, we still often perceive GERD as strictly an acid disorder. 
I'd like to highlight here what we know about the pathophysiology of GERD, and it includes a lot of players, including aggressive factors like contents that reflux from the esophagus into the stomach, commonly acid, but also prevalent are bile, pepsin, and other mediators in the gastric contents. There's also anatomical considerations like a hiatal hernia, which clearly imply pathology for patients. But equally important are defensive mechanisms. Patients have an anti, or people have an anti-reflux barrier, which includes the lower esophageal sphincter, the diaphragm, and other structures around the LES that really protect the esophagus from the contents in the stomach. There's also myogenic and neuropathic um, approaches in this space as well. In addition, there's esophageal clearance mechanisms, and they include peristalsis and saliva. And interestingly, even patients with scleroderma or certain disorders that inhibit salivary secretion, secretion have persistent symptoms just for the inability to have enough salivary content to neutralize the gastric contents that reflux, and they have a more difficult time with gastroesophageal reflux. And in addition, there's a component of esophageal sensitivity. Clearly, some people have a more sensitive esophagus than others. So again, the highlight what we're trying to demonstrate here with the gastroesophageal reflux disease is that it's not just acid. You can see that of the contents that reflux into the esophageal lumen, acid is clearly a key component, and it's clearly well managed by the current therapies with proton pump inhibitors, but it alone cannot uh, alleviate all the symptoms for all patients suffering from GERD. There are other components in the acid space, including pepsin, but it's also important to realize that there are neutral pH mediators, and one of which is bile acids. It's always been known that bile does reflux into the esophagus, uh, and many people believe, myself included, that it's responsible for a lot of pathology in ALES, but it's not currently addressed by our medical therapies, which often just focus on acid. So empiric therapy, as I said, is often driven by a proton pump inhibitor. And proton pump inhibitors are very effective for gastroesophageal reflux. In many studies, it's shown that they can treat the majority of patients with gastroesophageal reflux. But clearly, there's a component that become refractory or don't respond to proton pump inhibitors. That's the group we sort of would identify as refractory GERD. There are algorithms for evaluating patients with refractory GERD. Um, and again, as I mentioned, PPI use is very common in this space. But to demonstrate the breadth of the problem with refractory GERD, it's important to realize that despite labeled use for GERD to include QDAY PPI, many physicians use BID PPI for this more difficult to treat population, despite the lack of evidence that double dose PPI actually improves patient symptoms. And that's one of the reasons we're interested in this space, to try to understand more directly what those patients are suffering from. So anywhere between 10 to 40 percent of patients suffering from GERD have what we call refractory GERD. And it's not, refractory GERD is not something that Ironwood has come up with. If you search PubMed today, you'll find hundreds of articles that call this refractory GERD. Refractory GERD is, is a broad term, but it provides an opportunity to better understand patients who have persistent symptoms and persistent medical utilization in the setting of gastroesophageal reflux. And again, it focuses on those other noxious substances, uh, even including hydro hydrochloric acid, but in addition to hydrochloric acid. It's an unsolved clinical challenge, and there aren't any really standard therapies or, altern or alternative pharmacological approaches. And I think you all know that one of the rising areas within medical care are esophageal surgeries. There are many things being tried in this space to specifically address refractory GERD patients. However, these, all of these interventions still fall under from the current coding into the GERD category, even though those patients routinely have failed standard approaches to gastroesophageal reflux disease. And their approaches range from radiofrequency treatments to magnetic beads, to fundoplication. So every year there are a number of patients who have surgical interventions for this refractory problem. This is just one example of anti-reflux surgeries performed from 1994 to 2003. So you can see in this case up to 30,000 30, or so patients per year are having procedures 
And in this case, all of these patients get coded similar to the GERD population and similar to the patients who are well managed with a PPI uh, and continue with their lives on a PPI, but clearly have a, a much higher utilization of healthcare resources. So refractory GERD is, is a real medical condition. It's prevalent in the population. And somewhat of 85% of patients experience heartburn regurgitation for six days per week. And often these persistent patients have 11 years of suffering. 50% um, may have damage to the esophagus. And they oftentimes have seven times more, more ER visits, uh, six times more hospitalizations, and five times more endoscopies. And sorry about how that's projected on, this, on the screen. Okay, so again, why were we seeking a refractory GERD code? Again, the current coding really just has GERD plus or minus erosions. And with our quest to better understand healthcare utilization and patients' needs, it's really difficult to even understand the breadth of the problem for these patients who aren't managed well with standard therapy, and also for research to better understand how we can approach these patients to provide better therapies for patients. So in light of the quest of greater coding specificity, we clearly think that this additional option, and again, recognizing that the only option available within GERD currently is GERD with esophagitis or GERD without esophagitis, we clearly think that an additional code will help us better understand the disease. And for us interested in pursuing better disease management and patients with true medical needs, this will be helpful for us in our quest to achieve that goal. Thank you. Are there any clinical questions for Dr. Shetlin? I think. I can't hear you. I can see you at the mic. Seriously, you can't hear me? Yeah, I couldn't That's that never I been that a problem rare. for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Linda Holtzman uh, with Clarity Coding. Um, I have two questions for you, doctor, uh, and thank you very much for uh, the presentation. Um, do I understand you to, to say that there is a, a standard definition for what constitutes refractory GERD? Because it, here in, in the uh, proposal, it says that it's a uh, uh, little response to PPI therapy. Is there more to it than that? I mean, does it have to be a certain number of years? Or Yeah, no, I think it's a good question. So I think physicians have a number of approaches for standard GERD when patients come in the office, even things from anti-acids to PPIs. Mm -hmm. um, so in that space, when, people, when patients fail that standard therapy, then they move into a refractory category. There are some subpopulations, like patients who have extra esophageal manifestations of GERD, particularly laryngitis or chronic cough, that those patients are more readily identified as refractory GERD patients because those symptoms of reflux are much more difficult to manage. But in terms of your specific question, there's no standard. It's actually the default term to the people who would fail the GERD approach but refractory GERD is a common lexicon for that population. Does okay. that make sense? So, I think so. So, this, you wouldn't consider this to be a subjective term, like mild or severe, as we discussed earlier today, that, that it's consistently used among uh, gastroenterologists when they use the word yeah, refractory? Yes. Yes, in my opinion, it's consistently used. And as I mentioned, if you look in the literature today, there's hundreds of articles that, that call this, quote, refractory GERD. There are even other relevant uh, terms like atypical GERD or difficult to treat GERD or intractable GERD. And I'm not counting those in the hundreds that specifically identify it as refractory GERD. Actually, that's my second question, which is, are there alternate terms to yes. refractory, intractable, uh, pharmacologically resistant, uh, treatment resistant, or because if if there are, um, I mean, I was looking at the proposal, and if there are other terms that mean refractory, that that may be something that we want to get into in the proposal. Yeah. Thank you. No, that's a fair comment. We, of course, would not be adverse to another term that would identify this medical need population. I will tell you though that there is a a misconception, I think, with our proposal that we're trying to, to make a, a pharmacological group or something like that, and that's not the intent. Um, we are just, I, no, <laughs> but I, I think it's a valid point. I, I'm, I'm a physician and I was in academics for 10 years before I joined industry, uh, so I think it's a fair comment to question what we do. No, no, I wasn't going there at all. I was actually just looking at it from a coder's perspective. If, I, if I'm reading a chart and it says intractable um, GERD, I would think to myself, 
Is that the same thing as refractory? Should I use that refractory code? Yep. And it would be helpful, um, in, and I know you're going to get to this, <laughs> um, but it would be helpful if um, the proposal itself used the term or included it as, you know, a, as a synonym or something like that, then that way, or index or something like yeah. that. That way I would know. I wouldn't yeah. have to guess. No, I think so. I appreciate it. And, and my comment was not necessarily related to your point, much to the broader perspective, because we did actually have an original proposal which rested more on persistent GERD despite pharmacological therapy like a PPI. We actually removed that framework and went strictly with refractory so there was no misconception that we were trying to link that. And again, our effort for that linkage was really to address that the majority of patients get a PPI, and that's sort of one of the normal routes to being des designated as refractory, meaning failing a PPI. But we've, t we've actually modified that. We've only, this is our first submission. We did that by talking to experts externally when we, we made that modification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, moderator, could you please open the lines for any clinical questions? Okay, I will go ahead and go into the proposed tabular modifications. Tabular modifications are at category K21 for the gastroesophageal reflux disease to create a new subcategory K21.0 for gastroesophageal reflux disease with esophagitis to delete the existing inclusion term reflux esophagitis. Creating a new code K21.00 for gastroesophageal reflux disease with esophagitis not specified as refractory. To add two inclusion terms, gastroesophageal reflux disease with esophagitis, NOS, and reflux esophagitis. Also creating a new code K21.01 for refractory gastroesophageal reflux disease with esophagitis to create a new subcategory K21.9 for the gastroesophageal reflux disease without esophagitis, deleting the existing inclusion term for esophageal reflux, NOS, creating two new codes, one K21.90 for gastroesophageal reflux disease without esophagitis, not specified as refractory, at that code, two inclusion terms to read gastroesophageal reflux disease without esophagitis, NOS, and esophageal reflux, NOS. Also creating a new code, K21.91, for refractory gastroesophageal reflux disease without esophagitis. Are there any comments or questions here in the room on the coding piece? Okay. Add inclusion terms? Okay. For those. Like it is like under migraine and seizure, these terms are the equivalent. Okay. Thank you. Moderator, are there any, uh, are the lines open? Let's see. They may be open. Yes, ma'am. The lines are open. Okay, great. Are there any um, questions or comments on the line? Okay. Hearing none, at this time I'm going to turn the podium over to Ms. Cheryl Bullock. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Our next presentation, after lunch presentation, is can be found on, in part one, page 19 of the topic packet. The topic is cyclin-dependent kinase-like CDKL5 deficiency disorder. Um, the, we have a clinical presenter, uh, Dr. Eric Marsh. He's associate professor of neurology and pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and he has worked extensively with clinical trials and research at that facility.
Thank you, uh, Cheryl. And thank you for the committee for inviting me to speak on behalf of uh, CDKL5 deficiency, deficiency disorder. It is a tongue twister to say it, to get it all out. Um, my name is Eric Marsh. I am a child neurologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I spend most of my time uh, doing uh, basic science and clinical research on early onset epilepsies, including CDKL5. I am involved in the International uh, Foundation for CDKL5 Research Centers of Excellence and involved in a clinical trial for a drug ganolaxone with, um, on CDKL5. So what is CDKL5? CDKL5 was first identified in 2004. It's the cyclin-dependent kinase-like 5. And it's located on the X chromosome, as shown in the upper right-hand corner. It was previously called STK9, or serine threonine kinase 9. It's a 118 kilodalton protein that is widely distributed in all tissues, with highest expression in the brain, thymus, and testes. And the structure of the protein is shown in the second image down. And whole mount embryo staining reveals that it's ubiquitous, but primarily localized in the nucleus. It functions as a kinase, and it has autophosphorylation activity such that it um, uh, can activate itself. The complete targets are unknown, um, and it, it, we know that it causes perinuclear localization and that the CD, uh, terminus may regulate the function of CDKL5. And one of the unique things about CDKL5 versus the other cyclin-dependent kinases is its long um, C terminus. And in the bottom picture shows the structure of the protein with uh, mutations uh, that have been seen in patients uh, over the last number of years. So that is CDKL5. What is CDD? Well, CDD is CDKL5 deficiency disorder, because everyone who has this condition has a loss of function or decreased function in CDKL5. Um, and it was first identified in 2003. And since that time, it's been clear that CDKL5, or CDD for short, is a unique and complex developmental encephalopathy. It has its major symptoms of epilepsy, motor and cognitive disabilities, movement disorders, cortical visual impairment, and systemic issues, including GI dysfunction, growth de um, deficiency, and together these all encompass the clinical presentation of CDD. The current uh, occurrence of this is believed to be about 1 in 40,000 live births, making it more, one of the more common forms of single gene epilepsies. But the exact instance of this is unknown because there is no um, good way to code for this disorder. The disorder primarily affects girls. The boys can be affected and often more severely. And recently, a um, review of the clinical symptoms of CDKL5 or CDD uh, was published in Pediatric Neurology, and I'll be getting into that in a second. So from that paper, uh, a group of experts came together to decide what are the um, common clinical characteristics and the proposed minimal diagnostic criteria for this disorder. And as I said, a severe early onset and refractory epilepsy is most common, and it present in essentially 100% of patients, though there are some more recent reports of patients without as severe of epilepsy. Um, severe global developmental delay, uh, which leads to ultimately intellectual disability. Um, profound hypotonia, cortical visual impairment, which is something to be uh, relatively unique in this uh, population of early onset seizures. Um, sleep disturbances, dyskinetic movements, autonomic and breathing disturbances, GI disturbances, including significant reflux and constipation and dysmotility, as well as dysphagia. From this, a proposed minimal diagnostic criteria was created that you need to have a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in the CDKL5 gene, that you have to have motor and cognitive developmental delays, and you have to have epilepsy within the first year of life. So why is CDD unique? Well, CDD is clearly defined. It has ep early onset epilepsy with a median age of onset within six weeks and 90% by three months, and that this becomes highly resistant to medication over time. It has a unique seizure pattern. A large majority of these patients have this unique pattern where they have this hypermotor, which means they kind of just move all the extremities, not in your classic tonic-clonic type pattern. Then they get stiff or tonic, and then they have a, what looks to be like an infantile spasm or an epileptic spasm where their body comes in. And this sequence seems to be somewhat unique for CDD. They have severe global developmental delay, um, significant movement disorders, uh, and particularly, a lot of these girls will cross their legs back and forth over and over again. 
Uh, they have intellectual disability, or ultimately end up with intellectual disability. Um, with impaired language, uh, these girls do not speak, and impaired hand functions, they have uh, decreased or minimal use of their hands. Very low tone, cortical visual impairment, and then uh, other systemic dysfunction. So how are CDD patients currently coded? Well, one of two ways most physicians, child neurologists, would do this. One is that it's historically linked to Rett syndrome. Rett syndrome is due to mutations in the gene MECP2. And originally, CDD was, the CDKL5 gene was found in patients who looked a little bit like Rett syndrome, but they had early onset epilepsy. Girls with uh, Rett syndrome typically don't develop epilepsy till after three years of age, but there was this cohort who had um, early onset seizures, and those ended up all being, or almost all being, um, due to mutations in uh, CDKL5. And as opposed to Rett syndrome, where they're very, very visually attentive, these girls also had significant visual impairment, cortical visual impairment. The other way they're coded is because these are an intractable epilepsy phenotype. So they're uh, coded like an epilepsy syndrome with severe neuro neurodevelopmental affectation. And due to the overlapping nature of these symptoms, you can see why this would be. And this is demonstrated in the figure down below where you have Rett syndrome as the core on the left, but epilepsy, lennox gastaut syndrome, intellectual disability, de developmental delay, all associated with this. Or as primarily as a generalized epilepsy with the other symptoms, including a genetic disorder associated with this. And while CDD has these unique features, there's other similar disorders who have these other features who have um, their own specific ICD-10 uh, codes, including tuberous sclerosis, Rett syndrome, and Angelman syndrome. And all these have overlapping clinical features just uh, as CDD, but all of these are clearly unique syndromes, as is CDD. And this is uh, documented, demonstrated here by tuberous sclerosis, Rett, or Angelman as the core symptoms, but they have as the core syndrome, the, the diagnostic syndrome, but with all these other symptoms that can be independently coded, but they really are all a unique disorder, as is CDD. So CDD is unique. It's unique, um, and it's not a subset of other syndromes. It shouldn't be by itself, it shouldn't be included in other codes. It's unique in the minds of the medical community. The child neurology community really thinks of when you see a new onset infantile spasms in a girl, CDD comes to mind in, in most uh, physicians' minds. Um, it requires a unique code to understand who these patients are and the full spectrum of their clinical phenotype. And it requires its own code to move research forward. And there's also... Uh, um, unique implications and treatment implications for this because in CDD, seizures might become worse with some anti-epileptic medications, often with uh, the drug carbamazepine. It affects visual uh, function, so it really requires the physician and the people who treat this to understand this and think about uh, getting vision therapy and avoiding drugs that can affect visual function, such as vigabatrin. Um, the language ability is very limited, so it requires speech therapy and consideration of augmentative communication to help these children reach their uh, maximal potential. And their motor function is strongly affected, so they need physical therapy, occupational therapy, and access to um, orthotics and orthopedics. And then they also need uh, close follow-up by GI. And having a code that puts this all together so that these things can all be linked to it would be very uh, important for this condition. And then, most importantly, knowing the full extent of this disorder will allow research to move forward. And because of the amazing advocacy of the International Foundation of CDKL5 Research, as well as the Lulu Foundation, and uh, many uh, child neurologists around the country and around the world, there's been a lot of movement in research in this disorder, including um, four clinical trials that are ongoing now. And so it's important for um, allowing people to have access to these medications after these clinical trials go through if they're successful, um, so that there's a code that links to um, get reimbursed or to be able to get these uh, medications. And, you know, the FDA and the EMA have agreed to a p the pivotal phase three trial using the diagnosis of CDD for ganalaxone for marketing approval, so it would make sense that there's a ICD-10 code associated with this. So without this code, you can't really decide on uh, reimbursement. So CDD is unique enough that pharmaceutical companies and researchers are studying this as a unique disorder. It makes sense that it has its unique code. 
So current codes aren't specific enough, so we need a unique code to define the dif disorder um, and capture the multi-system effects and track the mortality of this disease. And this would all be aided uh, profoundly by having its own ICD-10 code. And without it, there's confusion and inconsistent records, um, multiple codes for different patients. That makes it hard to find out who really has CDD and follow these patients along. And it introduces friction in clinical care with insurance companies um, not uh, authorizing particular drugs or particular uh, treatment options for these kids because they're missing a code um, that they should have. And having one code that would tie this all together would do that. Therefore, lacking a code directly harms and affects patient care. So to summarize, there's currently no ICD-10 code with the specificity and meaning of CDKL5 deficiency disorder. Other syndromes which are less specific, i.e. they have multiple causes, have their own unique codes. And without a code, there's harms to the patients, as I've described, such as inability to uh, flag inappropriate prescriptions, inability to determine um, qualifications for novel treatments, failure to authorize visual tests for cortical visual impairment, failure to alert families about risk of aspiration due to hypotonia, failure to alert or authorize language, physical, or occupational therapies, failure to alert families about um, potential recurrence risk, and many other uh, things that having a unique code would help. With that, I will end, and thank you for your time. Are there any clinical questions? Clinical? Hi, June um, Bronner, IMO. Uh, just for, to clarify, um, is this a metabolic disorder or a genetic disorder because the gene is missing? Yes, so this is a, a genetic disorder. It's a single gene um, disorder, and it's a kinase, so it's not a metabolic disorder. Its okay. exact function of what it phosphorylates and what it controls is not known. But uh -huh. There's a lot of basic science research trying to understand that. Okay, aspect. and could you go back to the slide that showed some of the overlap, too? Like this one? Thank you, yeah. yeah. So this disorder has some potential pieces of overlap with these various ones that are listed here, even though it's its own unique Correct. Okay. So, you know, there, you know, C, you could put CDD right here because it has epilepsy, intellectual disability, autistic features, movement disorders, motor disabilities, as does TS, Rett syndrome, and Angelman's, and these all have their own unique ICD-10 okay. codes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Are there any uh, questions on the telephone lines? Okay, yes ma'am. Um, Donna Ragahima, um, in your proposal it talks that it's a multi-system disorder and as that um, slide illustrates, but it's been classified to an epilepsy disorder. Is that because that's the major focus? Because then do you lose the, all those other features? Yeah, so you know, Epilepsy is such a profound condition in people's minds that when someone has epilepsy, that kind of rises to the fore. But all the other symptoms, their intellectual disability, their motor dysfunction, their autistic features are equally as important. And this is a brain disorder. The whole, the brain is dysfunctional, leading to all of these symptoms equally. Historically, because of the profound epilepsy, this was coded more as an epilepsy disorder, but it really is a multi-system diffuse brain disorder that is a unique disorder. Which makes me think, should it be a congenital syndrome versus uh, where Under it's classified? Under epilepsy syndrome. And, and that, you know, as a group of physicians and the mm -hmm. foundations who were discussing this, we're going back and forth with this. And because of the presentation of epilepsy early, it was decided that it should fall under the epilepsy syndromes. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's a, it could sort of go either way. Okay. Thank okay. you. And I'll just add to that, I didn't get to the coding piece of it yet, but there's one new code, we'll touch this right now, one new code that is being proposed that the G40.42, um, the CDKL5, cyclin dependent kinase light 5 deficiency disorder. Um, of note, it did come in as a congenital proposal, uh, Q code. However, under the guidance of WHO, 
uh, we realized and we were informed under their direction that this condition will be mapped back to the G code. So we're doing this in alignment uh, with how it will fall in under WHO. And so that's kind of where we wind up there at that code, new code request. Yes, ma'am. I forgot I was still standing up. Um, can we go back to the, to the clinical presentation? I had a question on, um, yes, it's the slide before this one, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yep. that there you go. Yeah. Um, you, you showed a lot of uh, codes and how it's being currently coded. I just uh, wanted to understand how you came by this information. Did you do a study? Did you ask your colleagues? So it is. You know, did you check um, back your own both, records for the last 10 years? Right. So it's both <laughs> personal and uh, my colleagues. So there is a group of us in the CDKL, the, I, the International Foundation for CDKL for our Research Center of Excellence, and we discussed this and how we coded, and we were going back and forth on that there's variability in, you know, some people will do more of a syndrome genetic code, other people will do more of an epilepsy code. Um, and so, and then they're multiply coded individuals because they have all these other symptoms as well. Any other comments or questions? Nellie's deciding. You're going to wait. <laughs> um, Nellie Leon, she's St. American Hospital Association. Um, and, I, and I guess, you know, I understand why you would want to place it where WHO has it. But that brings up for me uh, another question about um, do we want to capture the other components of this syndrome separately? And if so, it would be helpful from a coder's perspective to kind of list at least some of them and also provide some guidance that it's okay to, to code the additional okay. components. Because, and that's what I was trying to kind of figure out is primarily epilepsy or is it lots of different things because it sounds like there's variability because some patients will have some other components but they don't all have exactly the same ones, okay. correct? Yes. Okay. We're good? All right, that's, thank you, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, is Dr. Bruce Lawrence here? Yes, okay, you're up. <laughs> First of all, my apologies for not seeing you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, our next proposal um, is can be presented, can be found on in part one of the topic package, and uh, on page 38. This we have a clinical presenter. This is about the identification of specific synthetic opioids. Uh, Dr. Bruce Lawrence, um, it works, he's a research scientist at the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation, and he serves as a data scientist for the Children's Safety Network Ergonomics and Data Analysis Resource Center. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. This will control them once they have it up there. Okay. okay. The Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation, or PIRE, is a nonprofit dedicated to improving health, safety, and well being of individuals, communities, and nations around the world. We're best known for three research areas. Uh, First, substance abuse prevention. Second, highway safety. And third, uh, the costs of injury and poisoning. And sometimes these all come together. For example, 
uh, the costs and benefits of sobriety checkpoints. Pyre manages uh, one of the several sites of the Children's Safety Network, the Economics and Data Analysis Research Center. CSN is a national resource center for prevention of childhood injuries and violence. It uh, is funded by HRSA. And my colleague, Bina Ali, runs CSN eDARC. Uh, she, along with our boss, Ted Miller, put together th this proposal. But they both uh, have other meetings today. I've been at Pyre for almost 24 years. Um, I work mostly with large data sets, including the multiple cause of death data, NICE, NICE AIP, and various HCUP data sets. The drug overdose death rate has increased from six per 100,000 in 1995 to 21.6 in 2017. That's a 250% increase in 18 years. And the death rate specifically for opioid involved deaths has increased from 2.9 to 14.6 over that same period. That's a 400% increase. Similarly, the rates for opioid-related inpatient stays and ED visits have also increased. Uh, over the past, over a period of nine years, the most recent we uh, had data to analyze, it, inpatient stays increased 5.7% and ED visits 8% per year. Since 2013, the death rate has increased more rapidly, and this is due mostly to synthetic opioids. Synthetic opioids are man-made drugs that mimic naturally occurring opioids, such as codeine and morphine. They're highly potent, and just a small amount of the drug is required to produce a given effect. The main examples of synthetic opioids are methadone, fentanyl, and tramadol. Currently, methadone has its own code in ICD-10, but T40.4 covers, covers all other synthetic opioids. The death rate from these over overdoses has soared in recent years. Just uh, between 2013 and 2017, it increased from one per 100,000 in 2013 to 1.8 to 3.1 to 6.2 and finally 9.0 in uh, 2017. And the, the big jump was in 2016 when it doubled from the previous year, from 3.1 to 6.2. Because of this jump in uh, overdoses related to synthetic opioids, we're requesting specific ICD-10 codes, first for fentanyl and its analogs, and second for tramadol. Fentanyl and its analogs are highly potent opioids. Pharmaceutical fentanyl is approved for treating severe pain. It's typically prescribed as transdermal patches or lozenges. But counterfeit fentanyl, along with its analogs like carfentanil, are not approved for human use. These are sold through illegal drug markets Often they're combined with heroin or cocaine or other opioids, or they're just mixed with fillers and pressed into counterfeit opioid pills. Fentanyl and its analogs are the main driver of the rapid growth in synthetic opioid overdoses in the last few years. 
The other big synthetic opioid is tramadol. It's a prescription opioid that's approved for treatment of moderate and moderately severe pain in adults. Its misuse can cause serious problems, including death and overdose. Tramadol is commonly diverted and abused by narcotic addicts, chronic pain patients, and health professionals. In 2016, 1.6 million people in the US uh, misused tramadol, and that increased to 1.7 million in 2017. So it's not growing rapidly, but still it's a large number. With fatalities, we can analyze death narratives to distinguish between fentanyl and its analogs. But unlike mortality data, medical data coded in ICD-10-CM uh, does not have a way to distinguish between the various synthetic opioids. This lack of differentiation between synthetic opioids is hampering surveillance of the opioid epidemic. Differentiating fentanyl and its analogs from tramadol in surveillance data is critical for public health researchers and practitioners as we strive to reduce opioid-related mortality and morbidity. Because fentanyl and tramadol are, uh, enter the market in different ways, different pre preventive responses are needed. These proposed changes would help the children's safety network in, in its efforts. CSN uh, shares data on opioid overdoses with leaders and experts representing national organizations, federal agencies, and state governments. Uh, my colleague Bina right now is at a conference presenting to uh, state health and safety advocates. CSN also uses surveillance data to provide training and technical assistance resources to states and local jurisdictions. Recently, a CSN publication on youth drug poisoning received a lot of uh, press coverage uh, from uh, various media outlets. A lot of other organizations are also working on re reducing opioid injuries and deaths. Google Scholar shows hundreds of papers on this subject using ICD-10-CM. In conclusion, the proposed, these proposed changes would improve research and tailor prevention and intervention programs. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, Maureen Nash, Providence Elder Place. Um, what's the clinical rationale for a underdosing? I mean, how is that not, uh, haven't titrated the dose up high enough yet? How is that related to overdoses? Why would you need a code for that? That's it, currently in the classification structure. Um, so that's why when we handle adverse effect, not adverse effects, po poisonings, poison. underdose and assault, that is one of the classification, um, I think I'm not thinking the right word, for, but that's how we break it down. Yeah, that's <laughs> just extrapolated from the current structure <laughs> yes. of, of poisonings in ICD-10-CM. That's currently there. It's, that's yeah. nothing new for this. Yeah, when, <laughs> when we're doing an analyses of this sort, we go out of our way to exclude, uh, exclude those cases. But yeah. f for other purposes, it's apparently useful. That's in the structure. Okay. And then um, y you said that... Uh, the, the treatment is different if it's fentanyl or tramadol? It's not so much treatment as how, the, how they get into the market and reach the 
uh, the drug abusers. Since f fentanyl is, is abused as an illegal drug and it's uh, surreptitiously put into other drugs and sold mm. to un right. unknowing people, while tramadol is a prescription drug that's just diverted from its legal use. And, and why just calling out those two synthetic opiates? I mean, there are the, quite a few others. I mean, I understand the, actually calling out fentanyl, but um, I mean, tramadol, uh, I mean, it's a pro-drug. It's a, the, why would you call it out? Um, n not having put together this proposal myself, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I would guess it's because those are the two, the two that uh, uh, have high, high incidence. And that while others exist, there aren't enough, of, enough cases to justify their own codes. Does anyone know if? And I, I think also I can add just a little bit to it. As far as we supported this war, it was approved to go forward with, with it, is because of all the literature that we've seen. There's the reference in the proposal of different articles uh, regarding research that has been done at CDC, and this proposal has been supported from uh, epidemiology branch at uh, NCHS to say that because of, I mean, we're all hearing in the news about the opioid crisis and the fentanyl, and these seem to be the drugs of choice, and I'm not sure if that's the correct word to use, but that's where the um, incidences are appearing to occur more frequently now at a higher rate than it used to be. So that, but a lot of the literature did support these two to start with. Okay. Yes, and the, uh, there is a, th a third code for other synthetic opioids. Mm -hmm. And I'll speak to the proposed new codes. Oh, God. So the, um, you can stay up here. Uh, the codes that are being proposed that, again, are found in, I think I'm on topic packet one, page 38. What, there's a proposal to create three new sub-subcategories. <laughs> Wait, just, I want to say 38. Okay, so at T40.4 dash, we are again proposing to create three new sub subcategories. T40.41, uh, poisoning by adverse effect of and underdosing of fentanyl or fentanyl analogs. A new sub subcategory at T40.42, poison and adverse effect of an underdosing of tramadol. And T40.49, poison adverse effect of un and underdosing of other synthetic narcotics. So we're just expanding it out of another level. For each of these sub subcategories, there are new codes being proposed that is consistent with uh, classification structure and the definition of the, the identification of the codes as far as a new code for poisoning, accidental, unintentional, poisoning intentional self-harm, poisoning for assault, poisoning for underdetermined, and underdosing. And again, I will state that this proposal is supported by NCHS Office of Analysis and Epidemiology. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Jean uh, Yoder, Lido Supporting Defense Health Agency. I, this is a clinical question because I just don't know. Um, how easy is it for the provider treating uh, the overdose to be able to tell that it was uh, fentanyl or tramadol or some other uh, opioid? Because, you know, emergency room records, at least in the DOD, three days, you'd better have that coded. And so unless somebody has some kind of an easy uh, to tell the difference or if the patient comes in with the packet in his pocket, um, I'm just wondering how do the providers know which one it is? They Don't worry. Them. Pardon? They tell you. The, the patient? Yeah, you ask them what do you do. They tell you I have a friend that will have it. It's 50 bucks a day. They tell you. 
Okay, so they tell you that it's fentanyl. So some of them will know what it is, and then some of them, they, they bought it off the internet, and, it's, and then it's probably synthetic. But if they've been diverting it, then they probably know what it is. Okay, never mind that one. <laughs> and the answer also comes back in the toxicology screens. How long do those take? Depends on the screen and how broad or small it is, because there's variability at different hospitals and different labs. So the more you ask for it, it'll take a little longer, but it's back in hours to a day. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ben, ben, okay. Uh, are there any comments or questions, clinical or coding-wise, from the telephone lines? <clears throat> okay. Not hearing any? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. My next proposal um, is a combination proposal that it's considering the new codes for the psychonine release syndrome and the CART-T status, uh, which is your sh sh shimmeric antigen receptor T cell, T cell therapy status. And we do have a presenter uh, who will, Ms. Junga Shaw, president and founder of Nimit Consulting. She will present the clinical clinical overview of these conditions in one uh, presentation. However, the, you will find in your topic packet there's two separate code proposals that address uh, this condition and what the request is for. So. Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Cheryl. So my name is Drigna Shaw, and I'm here on behalf of the Alliance of Dedicated Cancer Centers. My disclosure is I'm a paid consultant for them. An additional disclosure is that I am not a clinician. So I will do my absolute best and try to do justice to the clinical description of this um, incredible cellular therapy. Unfortunately, several of our clinicians, they some of them may be dialing in by phone if they can get away from patient care and clinic. So um, hopefully the phone lines will remain open. Okay, so we're going to talk very briefly, just a very quick background, and then we'll get into the, um, the specifics of the codes that we are looking um, to see added to the coding book. So first of all, we're talking about immune effector cells. So broadly, these are things that you would hear about or think of as the T cells, B cells. There's many other types of cells. Um, but the T cells are the ones that we're going to be talking about. They're your um, they're your fighter cells. They're the ones that detect and destroy um, infections and can go after cancerous cells. We'll also talk about B cells because those are the ones that the current products are um, targeting antigens on those cells um, to, to work towards curing cancer. So this is a, maybe the easiest sort of pictorial representation of what CAR-T cell therapy is. So basically, it stands for chimeric antigen receptor genetically modified uh, T cell therapy. And so basically, there are several steps that are involved. And so right away, it's, um, think of it as an autologous situation because that's what we have today. So that means cells are taken from the patient themselves, the T cells. So by apheresis, the cells are collected. And then they are um, engineered or manufactured. They're sent off to a manufacturer, and that's where the magic sort of happens. That's where um, the cells are um, modified. The um, cells are um, treated so that they can essentially identify, bind, and then destroy CD19. That's the antigen that will be on the B cell in this case. So, um, so that happens. It takes anywhere from two to three weeks. It depends on which um, product we're talking about. Then those cells are expanded and grown and cultured, and then they come back to the institution where the patient is going to receive that infusion. Um, so that's kind of the kind of the general um, picture. I um, I've had to explain it in more layman's terms, and so I don't know how many of you were um, fans back in the day of the game Pac-Man, but that was like one of my favorite video games. And so I sort of think of it like you know you have the Pac-Man and it goes to one of those corners, and I forget what it's called, right? It eats that little thing, and then it like gets supercharged and literally can go and eat, right? And you get to the next level if you're good at the game. Um, anyway, that's what I think of this therapy as being able to do, right? You have the T cells that get supercharged up, and then they're basically um, back in the 
patient's body and they go out and eat up the cancer. And, you know, this is a really, really new therapy. Um, there's two products that are on the market. Um, and so the only thing relevant about this is just to say there's two approved CAR-T products. Um, there's um, what came out first, August 2017, and that was for um, basically the pediatric um, indication acute um, ALL, or acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And then in October of that same year, 2017, the adult um, therapy for adult um, uh, DLBCL diffuse large scale um, B cell lymphoma. And then in May, the other manufacturer had their DLBCL product. So, all of that to say is there's a pediatric um, therapy here and there's also an adult indication. So, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is one of the um, major complications that occurs when this therapy is given, and it's called cytokine release syndrome. So um, there's a bunch of different things that can happen, and there's unique toxicities that show up with CRS. So fever, hypotension, hypoxia, multi-organ damage, and the list can go on. There's another major complication, and we won't talk about it today from um, a coding perspective, but we'll probably be back to talk about it at some point. Um, and that's what's called now ICANS, immune cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome. What's kind of neat about that one, if just as an aside, I got to see um, uh, the, a note of like a patient that experiences that and they write their name perfectly clear and 20 minutes later they write it again and it's less clear and less clear and less clear and then they're treated and then all of a sudden the handwriting comes back and it improves. So it's pretty, it's pretty wild like how quickly some of these things come on and then how quickly the clinicians work to manage and, and you know sort of get the patient back. So with CRS, um, again, in, in layman's terms, the way that I sort of think about CRS, um, it's sort of in this picture. So basically what's going to happen is cytokines are released into the system. And that's one way that you kind of know that the Pac-Man is working, right, as it eats up all the cancer, part of the cancer cells, part of what's released into the bloodstream and into the system are these cytokines. So in some ways, I've heard um, clinicians, and again, if our clinicians are on, please feel free to correct me if I'm being too layman-y here. Um, but the way that it's been explained and the way I understand it is, you need some amount of that storm, and that's kind of how you know that the therapy is working. But too much of the storm, if it happens, like I think of you know hurricanes and tornadoes and things like that, if it gets really blown, so you get to a category four or category five, it's kind of disastrous. And so there's sort of levels of the amount of the cytokines and the way that the patient is starting to react and then what has to be done in terms of um, treatment and therapy. And the clinicians are watching this super closely because um, you could have a patient that could go from zero to, unfortunately, expired within four hours or six hours or eight hours, it can come on that quickly, which is why most of the patients today that are treated with um, these therapies are primarily inpatient so that they can be monitored really carefully. Um, so there's also, so there's the neurotoxicity aspect of it, and then there's also just um, the overall um, release of the cytokines in the system and all the different things that can occur. The next two slides are um, coming from some papers. Oh, and I should mention, um, I very much appreciate Dr. E.J. Spall from MD Anderson who shared a number of the, the slides here. Um, and so these are just to show a few different things like on this, the things that are highlighted in the pink. It's basically showing CRS all different grades and what percentage of the patients um, that experience that in um, the different products um, that are on the, in the columns. And so for example, CRS um, greater than a level three grade, you can see the number um, number of patients, or sorry, the percentage there. The median time to CRS, that's sort of interesting, and also then the um, ICANS, the other um, complication that can occur, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. And then this other slide is simply showing that the CRS can be incredibly significant and to the point that it can and does lead to patient death. So unfortunately, we're not at the point where we can predict really well, like which patients are going to get, you know, the high, like the high storm level three, four, or five of CRS. Um, all of that stuff is still um, being looked at, and a lot of um, clinical trials are still ongoing. But we have gotten better at managing the CRS and and detecting it um, faster, and looking for the things that um, point to different levels of um, CRS. 
So this is just a picture of kind of like what happened. So you, like day zero is the day that you get the, you know, that bag of cells has come back from the manufacturer, patient gets the cells, that's day zero. And so as you watch the curve, basically um, expansion of the cells are peaking at about day seven, it levels out at about day 28. And the CRS itself, the, the onset of that is in a very finite period of time. It's pretty much like right away, maybe day two, maybe day three, but certainly within like the first 14 days. And so the main point of this is simply, it's pretty much happening um, during that episode that the infusion is given. So that like inpatient stay, or if there was outpatient administration, it might, the onset might be very quickly, um, but within the first few days. Um, other complications like the, the neurotoxicity, the ICANs, that really um, starts manifesting later. It's very rare that that would be, um, that it would manifest um, early on. So um, you're going to hear Cheryl sort of talk about um, the coding aspect of this. So I want to just um, tee up one thing, and that is kind of the history and the importance of documenting the grades. So there have been a number, and they're listed here, a number of different scales or grading scales that have been out there. And as you can imagine, and so some of these, right, are different institutions that have been at the forefront. Um, University of Pennsylvania, right, where the first um, um, little girl was treated for the pediatric indication. They had a grading scale. There were other grading scales. Um, Memorial Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson had developed scales. So there's a bunch of stuff out there. And the clinicians got together um, and basically said, look, we gotta, we gotta get this together. We have to harmonize the information, the definitions, the grading scales. So 49 experts from a number of different aspects in the field got together in 2018 through an event sponsored by the American Society at that time called Blood and Marrow Transplantation, ASBMT, now ASTCT, representing academic medical centers, um, National Cancer Institute, um, the American Society of Hematology, and um, the Foundation of Accreditation of Cellular Therapy, as well as the CIBMTR, the Center for Blood and Marrow Transplant Research. They basically all got together and they had a lot of presentations, clinical presentations from people, researchers and clinicians working in the field, and then there was a lot of robust discussion, and a writing group was tasked with coming up with a consensus grading scale that they said as one of their goals should be easily applied at the bedside, and that could be easily verified during chart reviews. So they went, went through an iterative drafting process. They then brought that back to a CIBMTR forum in October. Again, it had lots of different stakeholders, including NIH and other government agencies. And basically, the culmination of all that work is that participants basically came up with a unified grading scale. And they published that in December of 2018. And the physicians that are assessing the, um, the patients um, at, in, right after the infusion is given, they're basically documenting and monitoring very closely all the different things that are happening for the patient. So there's um, quite a bit of clinical documentation. To date, um, the coding community has just been able to code you know, some of the signs and the symptoms, and there's been no way to, to really capture um, what's happening in terms of the CRS. This is a picture of the consensus grading scale. If anybody's interested, I'm happy to either email or you can go on the ASTCT um, website now. And their paper is on the website, and it's a really interesting paper because it lays out those other scales and talks, and you can kind of see how the group got to some consensus. So they've made a pretty simple scale where they're really looking at fever, hypotension, and hypoxia, and then there's the different grades. Their scale itself doesn't show a grade five because grade five is death. So, um, you know, by way of summary, I would just say that this is clearly um, a very new therapy, um, and it's being used today for hematological malignancies. It's being studied for solid tumor, um, and CRS is a, is a very common side effect of the therapy. Like I said, you have to have essentially some amount of that CRS to know that the therapy is working, and that it's managing it so it doesn't... Um, um, affect the patient very, very negatively. So having codes to capture CRS would be very helpful um, for a whole host of reasons. The coding community has talked about it um, in terms of wanting a way to capture this. So Cheryl, do you want me to stop there before we do status post? Uh, you could do status post.
You may go on. Okay. Okay, thanks. So this one will be a lot quicker. Um, so the other um, piece that we wanted to talk about, and they'll sure will show kind of the, the coding proposal for that, um, is basically a code that would allow us to capture um, as a secondary diagnosis patients that have had this therapy that are then um, continuing to see clinicians after they receive the therapy. Um, and it's not, not unlike how we have other status postcodes, like we have that for stem cell transplant, for example. Um, so again, there's no code to capture that. And so without that, we really can't um, track the patients and know that um, those subsequent visits and treatments that are given is related to this. And again, with this therapy being incredibly new, it's really important to track, um, track these patients and to see how these cells persist in their body. Unlike a drug, right, that sort of takes effect and then dissipates, um, some amount of these cells continue to live on in the patient's body. And again, it's so new, we're not even sure sort of what happens downstream five years, 10 years, um, and, and what sorts of um, other complications might arise. So that's the status post. That's almost all I have to say about that. I will absolutely, so not only am I not a clinician, I'm also not a coder. So um, I st will be pleased to be corrected on, on any of the coding aspects. We do have some colleagues in the room as well as on the line, I hope, that can help clarify um, anything that I've missed. So turn back to you. Okay, do we have any clinical questions for Dr. Um, Jean Yoder Leidos, uh, Defense Health Agency. Were you at the NUBC, NUCC meeting? Because this was discussed there, and I thought you sat in front of me, but whatever. Um, <laughs> what did you say? The NUBCC meeting, you were there. Yes, you were there. I was at the NUBC meeting, yes. Right, and, and at that meeting, um, and the, what I'm asking about is uh, gene cell therapy, or gene therapy, cellular therapy, and gene and cellular <laughs> combined, because I remember that was brought up specifically, and they said, oh yeah, that's coming down too. And so, um, because we have a bunch of these coming forward, uh, and then uh, the CAR T is, is out there. So when we're looking at these, um, the cytokinase release would, would happen with the gene therapy, it would happen with the cell therapy, and it would happen with the combined therapy, right? Wrong? Maybe? Any I don't know. I, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, and so one thing, and I'll ask if any clinicians are on the line that could speak to that, so please interrupt if any of our clinicians have joined. Um, I will say this, for NUBC, they have separated out cellular therapy, right, right. and then there's separate for gene therapy. And then there's certainly, another one for combined. Yes, and certainly right. there will be, you will see CRS. I mean, cytokines are released into the um, body for, for a number of other reasons. So you will see sort of a, a cytokine release, right, related to other stuff. So the codes that we're asking for, they would be um, CRS, right, related to or complications of CAR T cell therapy, but NK cells, bite cells, like all, so they're related to immune effector or immune, um, that's the, really the term, immune effector cell therapy. It's kind of due to that. Okay. So this um, cytokinase release is not just for... Um, gene therapy or cell therapy, it could be something else. Yes. That's okay, and that's okay. fine. Okay. Two proposals are coming forth. Right, right. Okay. 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 <laughs> Let's look at the first one first. The mm -hmm. actual syndrome itself, the CRS, which is found on, in part two, page 12, two options are being presented for that condition just so that they can capture that this syndrome exists when they have had this type of uh, cellular therapy. Two options are being presented. Um, of interest is that we did receive multiple proposals um, on this topic, including EAB issues, so we know this is definitely, we need some level of clarification and no possible need for a code. So option one for just the CRS itself uh, is that the, at D89, a new code is being proposed at D89.83. Yes, yes. Okay, we're good. The, I guess 
late in the day, the computer's not cooperating here. But anyway, D8983, um, there is another correction. I had also included the CRS as a, an inclusion term, which is not correct because the, we can't have the abbreviation in the code title again. And so we will be correct in that. We're hoping uh, to capture some of the other conditions or manifestations that are associated with this syndrome. We've took, put two um, instructional notes that would say code first, the underlying cause, such as complications, this is just such as uh, complications of transplanted organs and tissue. Uh, we, in addition, there's also a use additional code to identify associated manifestations. Um, this is a beginning point. As we said, we received multiple coding proposals to start at least capturing some of the clinical uh, information as well as be aware that more information may be, additional codes be needed in the future. Option two uh, is again a new subcategory at D8983, the cytokinine release syndrome with the same instructional notes. However, additional six new codes uh, are being proposed to specify the grade. Um, and again, this CRS in this code title is going to be removed, so we have some editing to do there. It's important to note that, um, and it is included in the proposal, that ADCC, of course, has a preference of option two. Um, ESCHS recommends option one. And I was left with a note that says AAP, who also contributed, had some dialogue with uh, the development, input in the development of the code is also su are in support of option one. And again, this is just the beginning because the new uh, th therapy and Gina kind of to address what you were saying, that's why on the second code, hold on now, <laughs> on the second part of the status code, instead of just having status CRT, that's why we tried to look a bit bigger because there's a, lot, a whole lot of things, other things coming down the pipe to say for just the status code side of it, which is on part one, page 17, we are creating a um, new sub subcategory at Z98. 892 that says that's not unique just to CART. It will say gene and cellular therapy status. So that we've identified one for CART based on their request, as well as there's places to capture the other things and modalities that are coming out that are to be evolved. So hopefully that kind of address the, your question sort of gene, hopefully, maybe. Not sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, Nellie. Um, I'm Nellie Lee on Chisin American Hospital Association. CAR T is absolutely a brand new uh, therapy. We're still learning about it. We're still learning about the, the potential problems. Um, the uh, cytokine release syndrome is being documented. We've had questions come in to us uh, at, at the AHA. I am concerned, though, about creating codes that talk about grading systems when it's, it's so new and it's evolving. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I agree with NCHS and uh, AAP with option one. I think okay. it's important to collect this information. And because it's so new, it's probably not set in stone as far as what is grade one and grade two. And as we've seen, mm -hmm. it's still evolving. And there were different methodologies out there in terms of grading system. And while it is something that is being provided in, um, uh, by few physicians, few centers, and so it, among themselves they can talk and agree. As we learn more, the grading system may change in terms of what's included or not, and we'll never know what that is because it'll be locked into grade one, grade two, and if today there's this version and then tomorrow there's another version, grade one and grade two and so on may have different um, components, different descriptions. So I think for now, as a, as a starting point, option one is, is probably the best thing we can do. Okay, thank you. Sure. 
Thanks, Nellie. So I just also want to clarify, um, there's about 110 plus certified centers now providing the therapy, but you're right, it's still a pretty small um, number of centers. I would just ask um, the group to also think about, um, I, I think it's remarkable that there were five different grading scales in place, including an NIH or National Cancer Institute scale. Um, the pediatric oncologists, so I I've chatted with the AAP a little bit about this, but their own cohort of pediatric oncologists have a scale, and it has grades in it, and, and they had a multidisciplinary team that got together, and it was called the Lee Scale, and those folks also came together at the consensus meeting that ASBMT hosted, and they also got to consensus. So I think what we struggle with a little bit is, to your point, it, it very well could change over time. There's, there's no question because the therapy is so new. Um, but to have a single code from our perspective, what's challenging about that is essentially every case is going to have that coded. So it's meaningless. It will be almost useless to do any sort of analytics around patients that die or any sort of other analyses or understanding outcomes. So I think that's where we struggle because if every case has that diagnosis, there's no ability to differentiate. What I've also been told by the clinicians and the coders is that they continue to code all the signs and symptoms and then they use a free application that was developed by clinicians and it's on the ASTCT website that mirrors the grading scale I showed and that allows them to get to a consistent grade. There's been about 5,000 downloads of that grading tool. So it, it, it's going to take wi a while, sure, for everybody to kind of get on board and use it, but I've found it pretty remarkable that clinicians across these sites are using the scale today for whatever that's worth. Yes, Hi, I'm Teresa Krebs from Johns Hopkins Hospital. <clears throat> um, I'm happy to see that we have um, some proposals um, out there. Thank you both very much for that. I've been concerned since there's been uh, recent guidance from Cutting Clinic and that resulted in this condition being reported as tumor lysis syndrome, which is a different syndrome. So I'm really happy that we're considering a separate distinct code for a separate distinct condition. Um, I am a little concerned about only having one option because it seems like the, there's a, a big disparity in the patient population that we would be representing with that one code, um, from a patient who is suffering a fever to somebody who's suffering life-threatening illnesses that might require pressure support and high flow oxygen. So that's a very wide space to take up with just one code. Um, the other thing I was curious about is the code also note that I'm just seeing this for the first time today, so I, I wasn't aware of the transplant complication, and I was wondering if it would be appropriate to also add um, at the code also note um, to code, or code first under outlying cause for the hematologic malignancies, since it seems like that's what the treatment is being used for. Okay. Yes, Hi, Kathy Harrington, HIM Compliance Manager. Um, I just want to say that it's very interesting these past few days to see how things work. It's almost like a bill becoming a law, you know, and it's really the passion that I've seen between the two days is really remarkable. But at the heart, I have been in the coding field for over 30 <coughs> some odd years. <laughs> um, so to see one code when you have the opportunity to have five grades which are being documented today okay. so we can track how these patients are responding to this therapy, how they are treated, how they are managed. I mean, it's all about the data from what I remember from day one, you know, and how all of this can affect patient care. Um, so I am pretty passionate about the five, okay. five grades, okay. if I can say that. Um, I may not be able to leave the building in one piece, <laughs> but I do good. understand the need for one. I'll escort you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> but to have the opportunity again okay. to have, and we have the real estate for it, you know, and sure, things may change. I mean, how many times has sepsis changed, you know? <laughs> I can't keep, right? Well, exactly. But this is being recorded today. And I mean, there is really an app. There is literally an app for these doctors to use that has been downloaded 5,000 times from what I understand. So they are recording this data. They are documenting it. We are seeing it. We need a place to put it so we can effectively use this data. 
Okay, so when, so if it's documented in the record, grade four, whatever, mm -hmm. that grade means the same thing throughout anyone who would be, that can be clearly, because that was our challenge, because in the different literatures that we did when we did outside research, that we couldn't, we were not 100% sure the grade two that was created from this clinical group is the same thing as grade two. We did not find that completely cohesive document except if someone was working from the manuscript that w clearly spelled it out quite nicely. So that was some of our concern. Right, and I think that is what everyone is using. I mean, they are onboarding that right now, and that, I believe, is what this app is based on. Okay. There's a web-based application. They're taking this data. They're recording this data. They're using this data already, but we need to open it up that we can record it because, okay. as Jagna said, to put everything into this one bucket is in a true picture of what's okay. happening out there. Okay, so, please submit that you. in writing. So oh, and keep, oh keep okay, us. and if you would like to open the phone lines, I believe some of our Sure, I sure will. Let me get present. these two all on Thank the floor. You. Okay, no worries. We're gonna leave this down for the short people and then move it up. <laughs> um, I, I agree with everybody <laughs> in the sense that I, I think everybody has a point. I can see just using one code and I can also see using five. I have a third point, oh, my. <laughs> which, um, which is, I was struck by your statement that everybody gets this to some extent afterwards. And I find that like troubling <laughs> um, in the sense that if this is expected afterwards, if some level of this is expected, we don't usually code expected states. We only code things that go beyond that to the point where they're you know, pathologic. So for example, we went through all those gyrations with, and the simplest example I can think of is like a hemoglobin drop after prostate operation. Everybody gets that. We don't code it. We don't even code it if they get a transfusion. We don't code it unless the physician indicates that this has reached a, quote, critical state, where it really demonstrates, you know, or, or it has been established that this is clinically significant blood loss anemia. So I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm, I, I do like the idea of being able to see all the different levels. On the other hand, I'm, I'm hesitant to code something that is clinically expected afterwards because I think I'm nervous about setting a, a precedent like that. So that's, um, so that's a great point. And so let me, maybe I can try. I don't know if I'll get this right. Let me try, though. So um, in the consensus grading, right, so if a patient has a fever, I mean, fever is one of the most, like the, one of the most telling signs, right? But if they have a fever that's 37, 36 degrees Celsius, it's, that's, that's not gonna warrant, hey, I gotta put the CRS code. Let's just say there was a single code, right? They have to be above a certain level, and it's 38. And then if they've got, so, so that fever, that's partly what's happening is when the cytokines are released. So when I say the cytokines are released, right, like when the Pac-Man eats the cancer, what comes out, right, is a little bit of this cytokine. It's like this little juice or something that's released. My clinicians are going to kill me if they're listening. But, I mean, that's what I mean about there's a certain amount of the cytokine. But how much of that develops into fever, or into hypotension, into hypoxia, that is not standard. That is not going to happen for every single patient. So I think what our concern is with just one single code is are we saying that every single patient had a fever and that's it? right, versus there was organ failure, versus we had to treat them with vasopressors, or we had to, right, it's, there's no way to differentiate that part. Does that help at all? Am I gonna, am I gonna see CRS written on the chart of everybody who gets CAR T cell therapy? That's, yeah, CAR T, you know, CRS one, Am I going to see it on every chart? Because that was kind of my understanding from what you said, that everybody there, gets this. Is Dr. You, Perales on the line? Only, only. Oh, good. Can one of our clinicians answer your question? Because they'll do a much better job. Is, who is on the line? There we go. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Moderator, the phone lines open, please. Phone lines are open. Are the, go ahead. Dr. Perales, are you on the line? Dr. Miguel Perales? or somebody from MD Anderson? 
somebody better say something. <laughs> are they, Kathy, are they trying to talk, but we can't hear them? Can you text? Okay. Um, we do, okay. Dr. Perales, if you're on the line or one of our other clinicians, please interrupt. Yeah, um, my name is Ching I'm the CDI manager for Memorial Sloan Catering. Can you hear me? I guess I'll bend. <laughs> I'll Roll it up. Okay. There we go. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, I think what Jogna is trying to kind of say is that everybody, the CRS is kind of expected as in the storm coming on to show that the medication is working, that the therapy is working. <clears throat> but not all the patients go above, like not everybody reacts the same way to it. So some people might react in a, in a worse way. So that storm worsens to a tornado and then you need to fix whatever is going on. So if it is expected that they, do, they have the CRS for every patient, not everybody will meet the criteria for it to be a complication. So that's not so that, quite. I understand that's that not. very well. That was the nature of, that's that was the nature right. of my question. If I see CRS on every chart, you wouldn't though. What, get, that's why I asked. Yeah, it. no, you, you know, because it, it's CRS expected. It's only the when they stage. meet certain criteria okay. for the staging. Then that's when you would see it, which is where I come to. I think I support the idea of one code. I guess is okay, but the different codes that we have, the grades are better. This is the reason. Um, for the grade one, it's a simpler form of CRS complication, so it's like a start. The temperature goes up, um, patient might be hypoxic or not. And I'm a nurse also. So um, when you get to the stage two, it gets worse. So the patient might need, get hypotensive, need pressures. When they, go, when they start needing pressures, you start talking about shock. So they need more intensive resources to handle whatever it is they have going on. By stage three, I believe they are going into some form of respiratory failure because they become hypoxic. So if they need a low form of oxygen therapy, then that gets resolved a little bit. If they need some form of high oxygen therapy, then it gets greater to a higher level. So for every stage that they go through, different resources are used. Understood. That's the most important part of it. Um, for somebody who just comes in with fever and has CRS and then goes through this um, a little bit of hypotension, you might just stabilize them. Uh, give them something for it, and then they go home within one day. <clears throat> for somebody who has a grade two or grade three, and the most serious grade four, inpatient admission, that person will stay longer in the hospital. That person will require more intensive resources for treatment before you can even get to stabilizing them. And then even at that, they might get to a stage five. Okay. So having to grade them gives us the different data levels that we need to show how intensive the resources are that we are using, that's one. And then also to collect data, it's a new therapy. Um, two years into the making being approved. So basically you need data to show, oh, this is what happens with this combination of CAR T cell medication that I'm giving this patient. This is what happens in this number of cases. We have to have some kind of stratification okay. um, to show that out of 100 patients that I gave this combination of CAR T cells, 20 of them went through this stage one. They only had slight CRS going on over and above, or over and above, or they went up to a stage three and had this, and this is how long they stayed, and this was what was done. How many of them survived after that? How many of them progressed from a one to a four? Now, if we have that data for one patient also, if that patient comes in again with another complication of CAR-T, you already have something, a background, a baseline that you're working off of. The patient was there before, with a stage one, now progress to a stage four. With this stage, is the therapy working? Is it not working? At some point, you get to decide that. You can only do that with data. That's, okay. And then that staging is what makes sense because one code, like Jogna said, is general for everybody. Okay. It doesn't tell you anything okay. specific. Thank you very much. Did we get your name and where you're Chinwei, Anika, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, CDI manager. Sure, the lines are not open. Uh, the line, our people are trying desperately, coders and clinicians, to weigh in, and they are saying that the lines are not open. So is there anybody in the room from a technical point of view that can help us? Because we got clinicians out of clinic to call. I might get in trouble if we can't open the lines. Moderator, can you verify that the phone lines are open? They are saying... All the lines are unmuted. Do we have the right phone number? Can we get an, it's the number on the agenda? 
Yeah, it should be. That hasn't changed. Hello, this is Dr. Perales. Can you hear me? Hi, Dr. Perales. Thank you. We can hear you now. You might have to speak up a little bit. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm a, a transplant physician and cell therapy physician at Memorial Stone Kettering in New York. I'm also on the ASTCT Board of Directors, and I was involved in a consensus conference last year that led to the development of the new consensus grading. And I also chair the executive committee of the CIBMTR's cell therapy registry. So I also oversee at the national level the collection of data uh, related to uh, CAR T cells, which is required as part of the FDA REMS program. Um, so I've been very involved in this field, and I also helped develop the mobile app and the web page that allows us to collect data uh, on grading of uh, toxicity for CRS and neurotoxicity for CAR T cells. Um, so I've been listening to the conversation. I found this very helpful, and I think many good points were made. I would also agree with the importance of having a differentiator in terms of the grading. I think that is critical, as has been stated by others, to understand the different toxicity levels between the different patients and the different products. Just to give you an idea, the incidence actually is not 100%, so you won't see CRS for every patient. And there are differences in CRS between the two products that are currently approved, and we see differences between pediatric patients and adult patients. Um, and as we see new products approved probably over the next 12 months, we expect an additional product to be approved in lymphoma as well as in myeloma. It will be important for us to continue to collect this data and to be able to differentiate it. The, the ASTCT consensus grading is being broadly adopted um, not just in the U.S., but also elsewhere in the world. European centers are also using it now. And what we're seeing is that clinical trials that are being written today are using the consensus grading as part of their uh, reporting requirements. So we're really moving over from the, a, consent, a, a grading system where we had Penn and NCI and, and MSK and other centers have their own grading system to a uniform grading system that is accepted not just in the clinical setting, but even the research setting. And in fact, that meeting that was held uh, last year um, to develop the grading system brought together all the key uh, players, if you will, of the CAR-T field, including Trey Lee, who wrote the original Lee uh, criteria, is the first source on the consensus criteria. We had representation from MD Anderson, from Penn, from Seattle, from all the large centers that have pioneered these cell therapies. And so the field has embraced this, and actually we just had another conference in July in Chicago where we're now developing consensus criteria for management of toxicities, which are based on the consensus grading toxicities. Um, so I think I, I do feel strongly that it's important to capture not just whether the patient had a toxicity, either CRS or ICANN, the neurotoxicity, but actually what the grading was. And as part of the effort that we're doing with the registry, with the CIBMTR, um, as you know, these cell therapies were approved by the FDA based on a very small sample of patients. And so the FDA has required that the companies collect data on uh, 1,500 patients with Yescarta for Kite Gilead. And for Novartis, they have to collect data on the first 1,000 pediatric patients treated with Kimraya and the first 1,500 patients treated with uh, Kim Ryan for lymphoma. And so we are now doing this through the registry in the U.S., and we're collecting data on several thousand patients. At the, at the present time, the most recent data I have is that uh, there have been reports of about 500 cases of CAR T cells reported to the registry that were commercial CAR Ts, as well as 500 uh, clinical trial CAR T patients. So the registry already has data on 1,000 patients. And, and as was also stated, the registry collects not just the grading one, two, three, four, but also the symptoms that make up the grading. And so you do have the ability, if down the road things change, they can easily regrade patients because they will have the components of the grade, not just the number. And, and if there thank are any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions. Dr. Perales, thank you so much for um, stepping out of clinic and joining us. My good friend Cheryl here from the National Center for Health Statistics is saying, that she would like you to put that in writing, which um, our, your colleagues from Memorial Sloan Kettering that are in the room will 
certainly assist and we'll get that letter in writing and, and submit all of that really great data. So thank you so much. Do we have any other clinician or coding specialist on the line that might be able to respond to some of the things that were said in the room? Okay. We're good. Okay. Um, that we know that we're looking forward to any input, um, vote, not so much voting, but your opinions on which options should go forth, um, any revisions that needed to be made. And like I said, this is just a, a start one for this modality in treatment and disorder, um, understanding the need for data collection, understanding the need for not having too many codes. Are we going to see it in the charts, et cetera? We, we have a lot to try to sort out, but this is a beginning. Um, and it is an important condition to start to do data cap capture on. So having said that, thanks, Jenga, we'll be working. Um, uh, Ms. Donna, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Speaker. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, I have two proposals um, that I will be presenting, and then there will be two more. So we have four, and then I believe that will wrap the day. Is that correct? Okay, so four more proposals. Oh, just one aside. I was checking email while we were having the discussion on the CAR T, and one of the coders that regularly writes our office raised an issue that I think is probably germane to the discussion. And they were reminding us, and we've had an internal discussion about this at the office, of incorporating scales when they maybe are not quite finalized. Because if one thinks back to uh, the example of Glasgow Coma Scale when we added it and there were discussions about whether or not that was truly the gold standard and there was any misinterpretation of that. It, the conversation also came up when we had the proposal for the NIH Stroke Scale to add that to the classification. So I will ask all of you for those who were part of that present for those discussions to reflect on the kinds of questions that came up when um, the addition of other types of scales were being considered and whether it was the right time to add those or whether there should be some further discussion until a consensus paper has been finalized and everybody has basically um, agreed to the consensus document. So I will just mention that since there are others who were fast and furiously writing to me to make sure that I got that in. Um, and that again is from the coding perspective because I understand, and this is from me, um, there was a mention of a tool that um, assists people to figure out, you know, bridging the uh, scales. But again, as a coder, is a coder actually going to be using that tool to figure out what the clinician meant. So I think all of those things are very germane to uh, what needs to be considered as part of the discussion and invite your comments along those lines well. Um, and I see a couple of longstanding coders who are, are nodding in agreement that that is something that needs to be taken into consideration. So with that, I will now move to my first proposal and I will ask Dr. Mikel Menes to join me on the stage. And if you will all turn to part one of two on page 51, uh, we will now have a clinical uh, background presentation on Powassan virus disease. And introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, yes, my name is Mikhail Menis, and I'm from um, FDA CBER, a pharmacoepidemiologist. And I'll be presenting uh, proposed changes to ICD-10 CM coding for humus, human Powassan virus disease. So the FDA um, Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research mission is to ensure safety and efficacy of biological products, including blood and blood products. 
to, to protect and improve public health. So under uh, FIDAF 2007, um, CBER is responsible for actively monitoring uh, safety of blood and blood products. As such, CBER is using large uh, public databases um, to conduct active surveillance and to evaluate the spread of transfusion transmissible infections. Uh, so Powassan virus is a tick-borne zoonosis uh, caused by a bite of infected tick, uh, mostly exotic scapularis. And it is considered a very serious disease because it usually results in encephalitis and or meningitis and, and may cause death. Symptoms can include fever, headache, vomiting, weakness, confusion, uh, speech difficulties, seizures. However, many infected persons may not uh, develop symptoms immediately uh, due to a long incubation of about one week to one month. So um, also Powassan virus disease is considered transfusion transmissible. And uh, donors may be infected but asymptomatic and therefore posing risk to blood supply as currently there is no donor testing for Powassan virus disease. Um, recently, in fact, CDC's uh, Dr. Gold has described uh, um, to FDA the first documented uh, case of transfusion, probable transfusion transmitted case of Powassan virus disease. So just a quick background about epidemiology. Over the past decade, um, there's been a substantial increase in reported Powassan virus disease cases in the United States. A total of 144 Powassan virus disease cases were reported to CDC during the 10-year period from 2009 to 2018, with 133 cases being neuroinvasive. So substantial majority of those cases were neuroinvasive, an increase from about six neuroinvasive cases in 2009 to about 21 cases in 2018, with about 12 deaths or 9% mortality uh, among the neuro neuroinvasive cases. And most of the um, opposing cases occur in northeastern and Great Lakes regions uh, in the spring, summer, and mid-fall when ticks and humans sort of meet together and are active. Uh, so in 2018, uh, there were 21 cases of Powassan disease. And uh, out of those cases, um, all of them were neuroinvasive and resulted in hospitalization with about 14% mortality rate. 67% were males. The median age was about 67 years of age. And uh, illness onset generally uh, ranged from March through December, with uh, majority having a reporting onset during the April through June. As Powassan virus disease is transmitted by a commonly found tick species, Exodus scapularis, that also transmits uh, Lyme disease and babesiosis and anaplasmosis, it is expected that the number of uh, Powassan disease cases um, is going to increase and potentially pose a threat to the blood supply. So this is a little bit of a distribution, annual distribution of Powassan virus near invasive cases by year. As you can see here, there's, um, in 2009, there was just six cases. However, in 2017, there were 33 in cases, and 2018, 21 cases. And it's only what's reported to CDC, so it's likely that the number of cases is substantially higher. And here's a distribution uh, of Powassan virus disease across the United States. You can see here in Minnesota and Wisconsin, you know, you had the highest number of cases, followed by New York and Massachusetts and New Jersey. So you can see the spread is northeast and sort of Midwest uh, Great Lakes region. So the objective of the FDA CBER proposal is to introduce a specific code for human Powassan virus disease that would distinguish this disease from other tick-borne viral encephalitis disorders. So if introduced, a specific code for human Powassan virus disease will allow providers to record a specific code for the disease and thus improving diagnosis precision. It will allow public health organizations and researchers to ascertain and characterize occurrence of the disease in the United States using real-world evidence, such as large databases, and to actively monitor the geographic distribution of the disease in the United States. 
and thus will help in the development of national and local prevention strategies to reduce the spread of the disease, um, both stickborne and transfusion tra transmitted. So overall, the new codes will also improve provider awareness of human power sun disease and lead to better treatment and prevention strategies. So here are the references um, for my presentation. And um, uh, below a couple of the references describe uh, the first recorded by CDC transfusion transmitted case of Poisson virus disease. You can see here um, reference nine describes the case of, tra of probable transfusion transmitted of Poisson virus disease. And I'd like to acknowledge our participants. All right, thank you so much. Um, are there any questions? Are there any clinical questions on this topic? Any clinical questions on the phone line? Hearing none, we'll just go right to the coding proposal. Um, the coding proposal is, as you see on page 52, um, at category A84, tick-borne viral encephalitis. Uh, we are taking the A48.8 and expanding it and creating two um, new codes under that uh, now new subcategory, a new code, A8481, for the Powassan virus disease specifically, and of course, um, another new code for other tick-borne viral disease. Um, any comments and or questions on the coding proposal? Thank you, Doctor. It was very interesting. Um, I'm just wondering, from a coding perspective, do we need some kind of code first note on this for like T80, you know, transfusion related? Uh, I mean, if you if you know it was related to a transfusion. Yeah, the thing about this is that there's not much known about epidemiology, and the uh, disease may be underrecorded substantially. So having a code, a uh, specific code, will allow. Uh, yeah, us I'm, to ascertain the spread and geographic distribution, and that will actually allow for better risk assessment of blood safety. So oh. this is sort of the reason uh, why. Uh, I'm, I'm not questioning the need for a code. I, I favor a code. I'm, it's, it's a coding technical thing. Okay. Where I'm so, just wondering if we need a code, a code first note. A code first note. If it was associated, okay. if you know it was associated with transfusion, to use one of the T80 codes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank I you, like Linda. it. Thank you, Linda. Any other comments or questions on this proposal? Any comments, questions on the phone line? Of course, remember, um, you can always send us written comments. Um, so if you can't think of anything right now, you're not off the hook. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Miko. Thank you so much. Okay. Our next proposal um, is in part two of two on page 55, chronic kidney disease. Um, I won't go over the entire background with you. Many of you may remember we expanded the uh, chronic kidney disease code several years ago and um, added staging. And we now have a request from the National Kidney Foundation um, Kidney Disease Outcome Quality Initiative um, to create a uh, breakout at N18.3, which is now stage three, and to create unique codes under N18.3, uh, a unique code for stage 3A, and a unique code for stage 3B. And of course, we will always want to have an unspecified stage three um, in case the uh, Record documentation doesn't specify whether it's an A or B. So um, any questions, comments on the coding proposal? And we do have somebody coming to the microphone for those of you who are online. 
Hi, June um, with IMO. I, just a quick comment is, is the stage three and stage 3A and 3B universally accepted and documented like the other stages are? If, is anyone? It is my understanding that, that it way. is. Okay, great. Yes, this was a proposal that um, has been working its way toward us, um, but once they had the, uh, the consensus definitions out there, and it seems to be in standard use, though I will admit I have recently seen through the EAB process a record that just established stage three, which is why we felt it was important to include the unspecified. But I understand I that this is um, much more common in terms of documentation than it was maybe a couple of years ago. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on the expansion for stage three? Any comments or questions online? Have we worn you out, guys? <laughs> Okay, so with that, I will now turn the podium over to Shannon, who will lead us through the last two proposals for the day. Shannon. Okay, so the um, first of the last two proposals of the day is on page 15 um, in part two of the agenda. But today we do have Dr. Douglas Schur, who will be presenting the background information. And Dr. Schur is the Medical Director of Trauma at Barnes Jewish Hospital. And today he is speaking on behalf of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. The topic is electric scooter and other micromobility devices. Thank you, much smaller room now, so that uh, makes it nice. Uh, not only am I presenting on, on behalf of the American College of Surgeons, but a uh, consensus group has gotten together looking at injury prevention and scooters as we move forward. And these are the e-scooters specifically. This is a group that has come together, multiple organizations, including my ACS Committee on Trauma. And with me also for subject matter, Shamsi Sultani is in our front row here. She was a, uh, very big in the San Francisco area project that was looking at e-scooters and is very knowledgeable from an epidemiology standpoint. So we know e-scooters have been around since the 2000s. I don't know if you know, but one of the previous presenters says he does ride his scooter. Uh, he mentioned that to us as we got in. So it's become more and more uh, prominent, um, but there has uh, been a proliferation of them as we have dockless e-scooter companies, uh, over 100 cities, uh, 20 nations, and probably 38.5 million e-scooter trips in the year 2018 alone. Um, we know these are probably going to go up along with other e-type device utilization, uh, mostly due to the fact uh, that last mile of work uh, and getting back in terms of mobility is very helpful, especially in the inner city areas. These are narrow platform, the scooters themselves, narrow platform or deck with a standing rider. Uh, two to three wheels, depending on back and stability, uh, usually battery-powered electric motor, which needs to be recharged with a kickstart, a thumb throttle, uh, and some kind of foot brake, if possible. They all seem to be less than about 50 pounds, and uh, the companies vary. Uh, they set their rates, depending on city and other requirements, between 13 to 15, but going downhill, get up to about 20 miles an hour. You had to have seen these. These are some of the headlines. Apparently, the CDC even thinks it's important, at least uh, a couple of headlines. And you see this one up here about Atlanta uh, and what's going on there. There actually has been a spate of fatalities in Atlanta along this line. So these are clearly important new items that didn't exist when some of the other codes existed. These are the 13 known fatalities as assembled through media reports. And this is just the rideshare e-scooters. This does not include privately owned e-scooters. And you can see here in 2019, there's a bunch in Atlanta coming, a four in a row in Atlanta, and these are all deaths. You can also see one of these was a double rider, uh, which is a concern, again, using it wrongly, but important to know the double riding. And uh, along the way, we've also had one death from someone who was hit by a scooter. One of the problems here is uh, the way these are getting coded, as seen in m many uh, items that we've heard about today is that although they come in reporting that they were on an e-scooter or a lime scooter or whatever brand scooter, 
it ends up being a fall from a motorized mobility scooter, which many of us know is that the seated thing with a basket that people use to get around who are having wheel, you would normally be using a wheelchair in the past. Then you see a motorcycle as a code and then a fall initial encounter. Of course, none of these are correct for mechanism based on that. We also have shown locally, uh, and this is a San Francisco project, that if we can educate our EMS and hospitals that we can accurately code and diagnose each of these injury types or each of these mechanism types uh, if given the appropriate nomenclature to do so. Unfortunately, this is done at a mostly local level or maybe even somewhat regional level. And even if we could get trauma centers to do this, it would not include the multiple hospitals that are not trauma centers. They're also coding this information and, again, not correctly because the code doesn't exist. This is important. If you look at it in terms of either miles driven or vehicle trips, it's about 2.2, 2.1 to 2.2 medically attended injuries. Why are the miles versus trips important? It's because most of these trips are about a mile or less, so those rates will be pretty similar. Um, if you look at a motor vehicle collision, they're about 0.1, significantly lower in terms of number of trips or miles driven. Uh, and we mentioned, I already mentioned that a non-riding pedestrian was critically injured in a collision with an e-scooter. Uh, about 8% of these injuries are, are involved pedestrians not actually riding it, sometimes injuries by actually trying to lift or carry the e-scooters uh, or park, tripped over one that was parked in a weird space on a sidewalk. As we can figure out from all of these numbers, these are likely undercounts because most of the diagnosis at this point is done by searches of the chart at localized areas and maybe trying to extrapolate it. Because these are coded wrong, as we showed in that one example, three different areas, we know that these are extreme undercounts of the number of injuries that are occurring from these scooters, and we'd like to know more about that. Yes, people are riding like this. I think she's on top of the world. I don't know. Uh, I actually personally saw uh, a young lady with an infant wrapped up in the front thing riding an e-scooter, and that just frightened me. Uh, these are the safety concerns we see. And again, knowing that these are ways of riding it wrong, whether it's alcohol or no helmet or not, not novice riders or p poor maintenance, the point is that we won't even know which of these safety areas are a concern until we can accurately code and diagnose where these injuries are coming from and in these type of vehicles. We certainly are seeing minor to moderate injuries as a majority, but there are a significant number of folks who are coming in and needing to be admitted. Um, as we see on the second port here, about uh, of those that are, are admitted, the ISS, Injury Severity Score, many are familiar with, was around five, which is lower overall, but includes intracranial hemorrhages, people requiring surgeries for fractures, and long-term acute care and some of the more severe head injuries. So what we're recommending is that we use a V-code that is a pedestrian conveyance. Uh, in general, similar to the area of old scooters, but making sure we understand the difference between scooters and electronic scooters. Where they, this is certainly different than a mobility scooter in terms of rate and the fact that you're standing as opposed to seated in terms of your risk of falling, so it certainly is different. It really isn't like a motorcycle. Uh, where motorcycles is certainly at a slower, much lower rate of speed. Also, motorcycles are more likely to be legislated at, because they're on the street and powered. And in terms of insurance and other things, these devices are often used in areas that aren't the roadways. Matter of fact, some cities request that they are on sidewalks, while others say that they request they're on the streets. So it differs by state, but the point is they are distinctly different from motorcycles along that line. And they're much lighter, they're under 50 pounds, they're ultra light, so they're really not regulated at all as motorcycles. So you saying that they're a mobility scooter or a motorcycle really isn't accurate or adequate. We also have an additional code other than e-scooter, which we left as other, knowing that these are growing in po popularity in other areas, whether it's hoverboards or segways or other type of things that are these electric, uh, electrical conveyances, they are, they are certainly different than previous things we've seen in the past, and we want to be able to capture them because we would expect, as e-scooter has picked, on, picked up, others will pick up as well. 
But again, we need to understand what is going on with these scooters, the real number of injuries, and the ability to accurately collect them. We've heard all day this will help us with understanding the injury mechanisms and how to better prevent risky behaviors, helmet use, and otherwise. So I guess that's for clinical questions. Are there any questions for Dr. Schur um, on the background information before we discuss the coding proposed tabular modifications? Okay, seeing none, I will go ahead and go into the proposed tabular modifications. Take a moment to switch over. It's rather lengthy, so I'm going to get started, and then you will be able to just let me know if I need to go back to um, any particular um, code. So the proposed tabular modifications are at category Z00, V00, pedestrian conveyance accident, at code V00.0, to create a new subcategory V00.0. Zero 03 for pedestrian on foot injured in collision with standing micromobility pedestrian conveyance. Two new codes, one being for a rider on a standing electric scooter, the second new code being for pedestrian on foot injured in collision with rider of other standing pedestrian conveyance. And the two inclusion terms under that code would be pedestrian on foot injured in collision with rider of Segway. And an inclusion term, pedestrian on foot injured in collision with rider of hoverboard. At category, at code V00.8, accident on other pedestrian conveyance to create a new subcategory V00.84 accident with standing micromobility pedestrian conveyance. Again, here with three new codes, V00.841 for fall from standing electric scooter, V00.842 for pedestrian on standing electric scooter colliding with stationary object, and code V00.848, other accident with standing micromobility pedestrian conveyance with two additional inclusion terms, one accident with Segway, an accident with hoverboard. The same pattern would follow at the following um, category and code levels. So the same pattern would follow at category V01 for pedestrian injured in collision with a pedal cycle at that code V01.0, pedestrian injured in collision with pedal cycle and non-traffic accident also at V01.1 for pedestrian injured in collision with a pedal cycle in traffic accident. At V01.9 for unspecified whether it's traffic or non-traffic accident. At category V02 for pedestrian injured in collision with two or three wheeled motor vehicle. At code V02.0 pedestrian injured in collision with two or three wheeled motor vehicle in a non-traffic accident. Similar pattern would follow at V02.1 for the pedestrian injured in collision with two or three wheeled motor vehicle in traffic accident. Also at code V02.9 for the non-traffic accident of the two or three wheeled motor vehicle unspecified whether traffic or non-traffic accident. With a similar pattern also repeated at category V03 for pedestrian injured in collision with a car, pickup, or van. At code V03.0, pedestrian injured in collision with car, pickup, or van in non-traffic accident. Also at code V03.1 and code V03.9 for the pedestrian injured in collision with car pickup 
or van, unspecified whether it's traffic or non-traffic accident. Same pattern would be repeated. Add code category V04, V05, and V06. Add code V06.1 and code V06.9 for the pedestrian injured in collision with other non-motor vehicle, unspecified whether it's traffic or non-traffic accident. Are there any comments or questions here in the room? Okay. Moderator, are the lines still open? Yes, the lines are still open. Okay, thanks. Are there any comments or questions on the line? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to go ahead and move to the last proposal of the day. So the last proposal for today is found on page 28 uh, in part two of the agenda packet. The topic is gastric intestinal metaplasia. Gastric cancer is the fourth most common cancer worldwide and the second leading cause of cancer deaths. It is believed risk of progression into gastric cancer is highest among patients with diffuse gastric IM. The gastric IM is categorized histopathologically into incomplete, or incomplete and complete types. So endoscopy, endosco gastric mapping to define extent of IM should be done for patients with incomplete IM to rule out dysplasia or adenocarcinoma. The American Gastroenterological Association is requesting new codes to contribute to epidemiological understanding and subsequent development of appropriate surveillance guidelines in the U.S. The proposed tabular modifications are at category K31 for other diseases of stomach and duodenum to create a new subcategory K31.A for gastric intestinal metaplasia without dysplasia, and an inclusion term for intestinal metaplasia. Also to add the following new codes, K31.80 for gastric intestinal metaplasia without dysplasia, unspecified site. K31.A1 involving the atrium. K31.82 involving the body. K31.83 for the involving the fundus, and K31.84 involving the cardia. Also, a new category K31.B for gastric intestinal metaplasia with dysplasia, with three new codes to capture unspecified dysplasia, low grade dysplasia, and K31.B2 to capture gastric intestinal metaplasia with high grade dysplasia. Are there any comments or questions here in the room? We do have a rep here from AGA. And is Dr. Hahn on the line? You wanna check? Oh. Dr. Hahn, can, can you hear us? Are you able to speak so that we know that you are on the line? You probably have the same question. Um, I think it's a very good idea. I, I do agree, uh, and I appreciate that this is um, formatted and structured similarly to esophagitis. Mm -hmm. um, my only question is, um, it says that uh, in the background paper that it's um, believed that the progression of the gastric cancer is highest among patients with diffuse gastric um, uh, intestinal metaplasia. So I'm wondering down here on K31A, mm -hmm. Um, and elsewhere, um, what do we do if, there's, if it, there are contiguous or overlapping sites? Good question. We would have to decide um, if they're overlapping sites, did we want um, the one at the extremity or would we want to capture both sites? Um, and that is definitely something that we look forward to writing in or commenting. Okay, I will. Um, or 
to create another code, k 31a 5 or something, I don't know, that, that says... Multiple yeah, or multiple something. Multiple or overlapping, contiguous overlapping. overlapping. Or something. Hi, June, and that was basically my question. And then the other question is, is, was there a rationale or reasoning as you scroll down to the um, with the dysplasia not capturing more of a site? Where they just talk about the, the grades, the grades um, between the two. Let's see. Our, we have a rep here from AJ. Are you able to speak to in regards to whether you had more you wanted to capture under the intent for the dysplasia? This is Leslie Naramore from the AGA, and unfortunately, I. I, I cannot. Um, Dr. Huang said that he is dialed in, um, but I think it's, it might be similar with the other people who are dialing in. They just, they just can't speak. Moderator, can we please check to see if the lines are open, a provider that's trying to speak? All lines have been unmuted the entire call. The speakers need to unmute their lines on their end in order for them to speak. Okay. I, I will give him the instruction. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. This might be him. Dr. Huang? Dr. I put him on speakerphone and stick him up to the microphone. We can try and see if that, let's see. All right, we're, we're making things work. Hold on, I've got you. Dr. Huang, I've got you on speaker. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, first, uh, let me just say uh, thank you for letting me speak. I, I could hear you back then, uh, but for some reason uh, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't hear me. So, Leslie, if you could please uh, just uh, just repeat the question that the audience members may have for me. Okay. I just wanted to say, uh, stomach cancer is a somewhat neglected cancer, yet in the United States last year it showed 11,000 people, and there's a clear precancerous condition uh, similar to uh, uh, Barrett's esophagus, uh, which has an established code K22.7. There's a similar condition in the stomach. Uh, stomach intestinal metaplasia, gastric intestinal metaplasia. And the American Gastroenterological Association is in the process of developing guidelines. In fact, they spent, um, they, they have a technical review that, that is literally 200 pages uh, regarding uh, intestinal metaplasia of the stomach and its management and its risk and epidemiology. 200 page guideline, yet we don't have, uh, we don't have codes. Um, and so, uh, addition of these codes would tremendously add to the epidemi epidemiologic knowledge of this disease, as well as help us design um, rational uh, and cost-efficient guidelines to survey uh, those Americans with uh, uh, with this condition uh, for for stomach cancer. The most important determinant of the uh, of the risk of intestinal metaplasia is the geographic extent. Yeah. And so that's why in these codes we uh, proposed uh, the uh, delineating yeah. the, the extent of the disease. There are four major segments of the stomach. There is the antrum. There is the body or the corpus. There's the fundus, and there's the cardia, and so we uh, included a separate code for each uh, each one. Um, and uh, uh, in the case of overlapping sites, uh, which uh, does sometimes happen, uh, then uh, 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 then our thought would be to have multiple codes uh, 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 listed. So if it was disease involving both antrum and body, uh, then uh, to uh, to have the code for the antrum and the, um, and the code for body. Uh, and the second portion of the codes are the uh, gastric the in intestinal metaplasia with dysplasia. And so uh, in that condition, it, it, uh, uh, the, the risk profile is, is obviously much higher. Uh, and so similar to, uh, to Barrett's esophagus, uh, there's basically uh, special surveillance, um, uh, very high risk patient. Uh, so at this point, I think I'll just uh, ask if there are any questions that I could answer. All right, hold on, Dr. Wong. We've got a question for you. Yeah. So he can hear you too. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Can, can you hear me? All right. 
Okay, um, I was just curious in the second code proposal for when there is IM with the dysplasia, I see the various grades. However, the, the proposal does not have the sites listed and I didn't, um, whereas the first without the dysplasia has the various sites. So um, I was just sort of curious as to when there is dysplasia, Obviously, the grades seem are important, but I didn't know um, if the sites were important as well to capture. That's all. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's a great point. You know, because these are brand new codes and we were introducing um, a, a bunch of them at once, we weren't sure if it, were, it would be appropriate to go into such granular detail uh, at the beginning. Um, in general, once the dysplasia has developed, uh, then you're just a step away from cancer. So at that point, um, it, uh, it, it, I, I guess it, it doesn't really matter as much the site because you're, you're going to be undergoing very intensive endoscopic surveillance at that time. Um, so, uh, but I guess that's something to think about if we wanted to add the uh, location sites for the dysplasia as well. Okay. No, thank you. That's that's great, and I wasn't, and I totally understand about the number of codes to introduce, and I wasn't necessarily advocating. I just wanted oh, no. to make sure that by having those two different pieces of details in the codes, that mm -hmm. it, you know, clinically was s significant to yeah. to have those pieces. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions or comments on the line? All right, um, not seeing anything in the room. I'm gonna turn the podium back over to Donna Pickett. That was the last proposal for a diagnosis for the day. You can give yourselves a round of applause for your perseverance and your patience. It is almost it's 3.59, so we are ending the meeting at 4 o'clock. And again, two notable dates, November 8th, for your comments on the proposals presented yesterday and today, both for diagnosis and procedures, and for those considering new proposals uh, for consideration for the March meeting, your deadline is December 6th. Thank you so much. Safe travels. See you next meeting.